Most people, including Muslims, condemn Muhammad every single day without even realizing it. In general, whenever you say that some act is especially wicked or depraved, you're indirectly condemning Muhammad because he did many of the worst things a human being can do. What I find particularly intriguing is when people condemn Muhammad while trying to protect him from criticism. Take Pope Francis, for instance. Following the Charlie Hebdo massacre, Pope Francis declared, one cannot provoke, one cannot insult other people's faith, one cannot make fun of faith. So the Pope is laying it down as a rule that it's wrong and immoral to insult the religious beliefs of other people. But in saying this, the Pope has insulted Muhammad, which is something I thought we're not supposed to do. In case you're wondering how it's an insult to Muhammad to say that one cannot insult other people's faith, let's read a passage about Muhammad's interactions with the pagans of Mecca. The Messenger of Allah, Muhammad, proclaimed Allah's message openly and declared Islam publicly to his fellow tribesmen. When he did so, they did not withdraw from him or reject him in any way until he spoke of their gods and denounced them. Notice that the pagans of Mecca didn't have any problem with Muhammad preaching Islam until he started denouncing their gods. But according to Pope Francis, it's evil and shameful to denounce people's gods. Hence, Muhammad stands condemned by the Pope himself. A few pages later in At-Tabri, the pagans complain about Muhammad's intolerance. They say, We have never seen the like of what we have endured from this man. He has derided our traditional values, abused our forefathers, reviled our religion, caused division among us, and insulted our gods. We have endured a great deal from him. So Muhammad reviled their religion and insulted their gods, the very things one must never do, says the Pope. Since Muhammad is the pattern of conduct in Islam, it should come as no surprise that his companions followed his example by insulting the beliefs of the pagans. If you've got your kids watching this with you, you might want to cover their ears for a moment unless you're ready to explain some details about female anatomy. In the following passage, a pagan named Urwa points out that there are only two possible outcomes for Muhammad in his war against his own tribe, the Quraysh. If Muhammad is victorious over the Quraysh, he'll be remembered as a man who slaughtered his own tribesmen. If the Quraysh are victorious over him, his followers will abandon him. Either way, Muhammad loses, so he should end his war against the Quraysh. Not a bad argument. But watch how Abu Bakr, Muhammad's closest companion and the first rightly guided caliph of Islam, responds to Urwa. Urwa went to the Prophet and began speaking to him. The Prophet spoke as he had spoken to Budail. Then Urwa said, Muhammad, Tell me, if you exterminate your tribesmen, have you ever heard of any of the Arabs who destroyed his own race before you? And if the contrary comes to pass, by Allah, I see both prominent people and rabble who are likely to flee and leave you. Abu Bakr said, Go suck the clitoris of Alat. Would we flee and leave him? Alat was a goddess worshipped by Urwa. So Abu Bakr answers Urwa's entirely reasonable point with an extraordinarily offensive insult against Urwa's religious beliefs. Go perform oral sex on your goddess, Urwa! Can you imagine the international riots, the destruction of property, the loss of life that would result if a prominent person made remarks about Muslims performing oral sex on Allah or on Muhammad, or Muhammad performing oral sex on Allah? People would die for doing exactly what one of the greatest Muslims in history did in the presence of Muhammad. But Muhammad and his followers didn't stop at insults. When they conquered Mecca, they smashed the 360 idols that surrounded the Kaaba. Now, those idols were quite precious to the pagans of Arabia. The idols were the heart of their religious devotion. Muslims smashed them. Here we are, nearly 14 centuries later, and people die if someone plans to burn a Quran. So it's perfectly acceptable to destroy objects that are central to a religion unless the religion happens to be. Islam. It seems that there are three paths we can take, my friends. Two of them are grounded in moral consistency, applying the same moral standard to everyone. The first morally consistent option is to say that if it was okay for Muhammad and his companions to insult the religious beliefs of others and to destroy their idols, then it's acceptable for non-Muslims to insult Islam. Charlie Hebdo took this path. If we're going to make fun of other religions, we're going to make fun of Islam too. The second morally consistent option is to say, as the Pope has said, 
that it's wrong to insult the religious beliefs of others. But if we choose this path, we can only conclude that Muhammad was a naughty, naughty boy. Since it's an insult to Islam to say that Muhammad was a naughty, naughty boy, this option self-destructs. You can't make a rule against insulting religions if the rule itself is an insult to religions. The third option is the path of moral inconsistency, double standards, one set of rules for Muslims and a completely different set of rules for everyone else. This path, the path that says that certain things are wrong for the rest of us, but that Muslims can do them all they want, this is the path of Sharia, a path that many politicians and news networks are all too eager to send us down. Because the second option self-destructs, we're left with either the morally consistent position that it's perfectly acceptable to make fun of Muhammad, or the morally inconsistent position of Sharia. If you're considering Sharia, you might want to take a vacation to the Islamic State for a few months so you can experience Sharia in all its brutal glory. Then, if you somehow make it out of the Islamic State with your head still attached to the rest of your body, and you choose the path of moral consistency, no special treatment for Islam, this doesn't mean you have to insult anyone's religion, or that you have to like the cartoons of Charlie Hebdo, simply means that when a Muslim demands a rule, moral or legal, against insulting his religion, your response must be, my Muslim friend, I am not, never have been, and never will be your dhimmi. And if you absolutely must kill me for that, I suggest cutting the carotid artery just under the left ear. Or words to that effect. <laughs>